This is the new Hyundai Santa Fe and it's a little bit like Viagra. Now let me explain. You see, Hyundai did a study and they found out that the brand name of Santa Fe was more recognisable amongst the general public than their own brand name Hyundai, which is the same as for Viagra because, yeah, we all have heard of that, but no one has an idea of who makes it because obviously, yeah, none of us have ever used it. No, I'm just, um, yeah, it's one of my props for later. Anyway, so this car, it's the kind of thing you're going to be considering if you're looking at something like a Kia Sorento or maybe a Skoda Kodiak because it's a seven-seater practical family SUV. It starts from £33,500, but you can save an average of around £6,000 off one through CarWow. Now, if you click on the pop-out banner just up there in the top right-hand corner of the screen or follow the link below the video, you can go to CarWow to make sure you're paying a fair price for your new car. Let's start this review by talking about this car's design. I think it's a real premium looking product. It's got plenty of presence, this SUV. And the thing I really like about it is that regardless of which model you go for, you don't feel short changed in terms of the visual. So they all have shiny bits of trim, roof bars. The only difference is as you move up the range is wheel size. They still have the same aggressive front end. I'll just show you the entry level car now. See, it doesn't look that much different, does it? I like that, that's good. How about the inside? Is it posh enough though? Do you know what? Yeah, it is. It feels expensive in here. Like the design of it, the way it swoops with the two level dash, the bits of trim about the place, this glossy effect in. Look, you've got stitching on the dash as well and it's leatherette. Feels all good. But then you look a bit closer and you realise that it isn't quite up to the standards of premium cars such as Land Rover, BMW or Audi. So it's scratchy plastics here, plastics here, a bit scratchy. I can't fault how solid it feels. Look, that's solid. You know, it feels tough and robust and like nothing will break. It's quite nice. I'm quite happy with this. The layout of it as well is very, very simple to use. So all the buttons are nice and big. They're exactly where you expect them to be as well. Climate controls are there. You've got your driving functions there. You've got your safety stuff there. Your window switches there. You can compare it to something like a Toyota RAV4 where they just like get the buttons and just throw them randomly around the cabin. This is much simpler. And speaking of which, let's talk about this car's equipment list. The entry level SE gets dual zone, climate control, parking sensors at the back and the front, and adaptive cruise control plus auto emergency braking. Move up to the premium model and you get an 8 inch rather than a 7 inch touchscreen and it also has built in satellite navigation rather than just the usual Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Plus that car also gets a digital driver's display. It also has keyless entry with automated boot opening. You just have to get close to the boot and it opens. No foot waving like in other cars. You also get full leather interior, electric operation of the front seats, and all seats, including the rears, are heated, and so too is the steering wheel, and the premium is the pick of the range. However, if you've got money burning a hole in your pocket, you could upgrade to the premium SE, and that adds a surround view camera in addition to the normal standard fit reversing camera. And it also has lots of different views as well, which is kind of cool. A huge glass roof that opens, though I'm not going to show you that now because I'll fall off, and called front seats, which is perfect if, like me, you've got a hot ass. Right, let's talk about this car's infotainment system. So the positioning of it is good because it's more in your line of sight while you're driving, but it does look a little bit stuck on. In terms of the system itself, well, the screen is really sharp and responsive and the graphics nice. The menu is a bit monochrome though, and it could do with a bit more color. There are separate buttons for the map and navigation, which are really helpful, but the on-screen home button is small. Still, you don't really need it. The sat nav is easy to program and the on-screen keyboard super responsive. You can pan, but you can't pinch to zoom on the map, which is annoying. You can add a waypoint really easy and the route options let you avoid things like motorways, ferries and tolls. It automatically gives you the option to reroute if there's traffic anyway. And I do like the fact that you've got a physical volume button as well. And of course, you can use a system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto if you'd rather use Google Maps. Now, the digital driver's display, it's not the biggest system but it does give you some functionality to look through various functions and features. However, you can't change the look of the display for multiple views like you can in something like a Seat Turaco. What I can't fault though is the comfort in this car. So the seats are lovely. You get adjustable lumbar support for your lower back on every single model. And there's plenty of adjustment in the seat and the steering wheel. So you're gonna be able to get comfy with your big or small. There's loads of cubby spaces in here as well. So the door bins are a weird shape, but they can still hold a 1.5 litre bottle if you don't want it kind of sticking out a bit weirdly. There's some more storage under here. Decent size. You've got 
an all right size glove box, nothing special. Then there's this ledge here, which is perfect for keeping your screwdrivers and tools there. And you might need those to help your friends in their Land Rovers, Audis and BMWs if they break down. Obviously, you won't need them in your high end because it's going to be far more reliable, isn't it? Just saying. Anyway, there's some cup holders here and they're a decent size. The problem is, is that if you have one of these smaller cups, you might end up knocking the top off that. That's not so good. And you do have some storage down here for your mobile phone, which is close to your connectivity with your USB, your aux in, another USB there and a 12 volt socket. Now let's check out what it's like in the back seats. Being an SUV, you've got huge rear doors. It's great. And the seat height is perfect for just flopping onto. Knee room, as you can see, is really good. Headroom's good as well, and I can make them both better because look, I've got sliding rear seats. I've got even more knee room, and that really lets me stretch out. I can increase my headroom by reclining this seat. I mean, look how far this reclines. This is great for long journeys, this thing. Let me just put it back, actually. There we go. Let's love it in a position which is absolutely fine. Now, the floor is completely flat, which is great if you need to carry three people across this middle bench at once because there's loads of space for everyone's feet. Actually, with three in the back, it's pretty decent, this car, especially for the person in the middle. The people on the outer two seats do feel a little bit twisty because of the design of the seats, but it's got a nice wide body, so there's plenty of shoulder room. So this is a really good car to choose if you need to carry three adults across this middle row. Now, if you need to carry three child seats across the middle row, you're going to need a Peugeot 5008 because that has three Isofix anchor points, whereas this only has the two. So if you want to see my full in-depth video review of the Peugeot, just click up there on the pop-out button in the top right-hand corner of the screen or on the link below the video. Now, if you need to fit a child seat in the back of this car, it is really easy. There's lots of space to manoeuvre. It doesn't matter if you've got a rear-facing seat either. There's still plenty of space. And if you have two child seats fitted, you can just about squeeze an adult in between them as well, which is handy if you need to carry an extra person to look after the babies. Another thing I want to show you is this. Look, so you've got a little bit of storage area there, but you've also got two charging points there for USBs. And then we've got an AC 220 volt socket. So yeah, you can charge a laptop off there if you need to. Storage spaces down here in the door bins is okay. I can fit my flask in there. Once again, the shape of the door bins is a bit weird. You've got some pockets on the seat backs and there's some cup holders there. But what's annoying is that you don't have any through loading, so you can't carry longer items such as skis and people either side. And there's a sun blind here, which is handy when it's sunny like today. Now to jump into the back, just press a button on here. This seat then slides forward. I'll do it this way, which is a bit unusual. And you'll see why ah! <laughs> Ow! later on. Now, check this out, right? So you saw how much knee room I had there. I've still got a decent amount of knee room here. It is a bit tight on headroom, but it is doable, even for adults here in the back of this car. Not too bad. And I've got some climate control buttons there as well and a couple of cup holders. So that is all right. Now though, let's check out the boot. Don't look at my booty as I get out. <laughs> So there's quite a few cool features with this car that makes it easier and a bit more practical to live with. For instance, look, there's no load lip, so you can slide things in and out. Another thing I like is this. The car's load cover fits underneath there, so <laughs> you can keep it out of the way when you've got the car loaded, which is good. Sorry, that was a little bit awkward of me, wasn't it? Dead easy to fold down the rear seats. Look at this. Just pull those toggles and then to do the middle row i just press this button here look there we go and then this one go on down you go and then you have a nice big load area to be fair it's not the biggest in this class but what can you fit in this one you can fit three large boxes in there across the back seats along with 13 smaller boxes there's also room for a large suitcase two small suitcases a set of golf clubs and a folded pram you can also fit a bike in there easily as well without having to remove any of the wheels in five seater mode there's space for one large suitcase two small suitcases a soft bag, a set of golf clubs, and even a folded pram with the parcel shelf in place. And with all seven seats up, you can fit in two small suitcases. You can also fit a set of golf clubs. So yes, I think we can safely say this is a very spacious and practical car. Now then, it's time for the car wow five annoying things about this car. The car's maximum tow capacity is 2.5 tonnes. But if you have the automatic model, it drops to two tonnes, which isn't quite so impressive. The easy access to the rear of the car is only available on the left hand side. If you want to get in from the right, you have to fold the seat down and kind of clamber over it like this. You need to have a real delicate touch to be able to operate the blind only switch because if you press it too far, it also opens the main sunroof and you're forever doing it backwards and forwards until you get it right. 
Normally with keyless entry systems, you just have to get near the car, then pull the handle and it will automatically unlock. But with this one, you have to press this rather nasty, cheap feeling and very small black button to get it to work. There we go. You not only get one large manual with the Santa Fe, there's another one that's unnecessarily large because it's for the infotainment system, but written in about a million different languages. And then, yeah, you're pretty much taking up all your glove box space. It's not all negative though. Here's five good things about this car. If you want to go for the full limousine effect, you can use these buttons to move the front passenger seat forward to give you even more space. Yeah, look at that. Lovely jubbly. With the four-wheel drive versions, you can choose the amount of power against the rear wheels by moving between the different driving modes from comfort, eco, to sport for even more rear drive bias. There's even a special diff lock as well for some proper off-roading. The head-up display of the range topping model has one of the brightest displays fitted to any car with a luminescence of 10,000 candles per square metre, which makes it easy to see in bright sunlight. So you don't accidentally leave your kids in the back of the car when they're playing hide and seek. These ultrasonic sensors can detect even the smallest movement of the smallest people. Yeah, so you don't have to worry of them dying of heat stroke. There's Isofix anchor points on the front passenger seat, which is really handy if you'd like to carry your big baby up front with you. Choosing an engine for the Santa Fe is pretty easy because there's only one choice. It's a 2.2 litre diesel with 200 horsepower and that'll get you from 0 to 60 in around nine seconds. Now you can have either front wheel drive or all wheel drive, automatic or manual. Now did you notice that? Gas struts on the bonnet, feels posh. Should do too because this car is very expensive. I've got the premium SE with the four wheel drive and the automatic gearbox and I put the details into the CarWow configurator because the actual manufacturer's price on that car is £43,000 and I've got an offer back for just under £39,000 so that's a saving of almost four and a half grand. Now if you want to try out the CarWow configurator for yourself and see what offers you can get back from our trusted dealers click on the pop out banner in the top right hand corner of the screen or follow the link below the video. This car is pretty good for motorway driving, you know. It's nice and quiet, it's smooth, it's comfortable. Also, I think this engine's got decent poke. I'm going to accelerate from 50 to 70. Put your foot down. The automatic gearbox can take a little bit of a second to respond, but then this 2.2 litre diesel gives good power and it's not that noisy either when you rev it. As for the economy, I'm getting 38 miles per gallon, which isn't too bad, really. I'll take that. When you encounter a twisty road, the Santa Fe neither amazes nor disappoints. It drives exactly as you'd imagine a big seven-seater SUV too. It goes around corners without falling over, but it doesn't go around them like a sports car. <laughs> That's all you really need to know. It's exactly what you expect. It's fine. This Santa Fe is fairly easy to drive around town, so you sit up high so you get a good view out. There's not too many blind spots. The turning circle's all right for this kind of car, so if you need to, you can make a U-turn. And the suspension, it's adequate over bumps. It does feel a little bit more jarring over like sharp potholes and stuff like that than something like a Volkswagen Tiguan. And if you click on the pop-out banner up there, in the top right-hand corner of the screen, you can watch my full in-depth video review of that car. Now, if you're interested in this car, you should also check out my video review of the Kia Sorento by clicking up there on the pop-out banner because they are very similar. Anyway, what's my verdict on this Santa Fe? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should shortlist the Santa Fe. You know, it is a little bit expensive, but it does feel quite premium and it's a very practical seven-seater family SUV. Do you agree with my verdict? Let me know in the comments section. Also, please subscribe to this channel for more videos. And if you click on the deals box to the right, you can see how much you can save on a new car at CarWow. Or click on the video windows below to watch another of my videos.